Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 2nd of February, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. Actually, just a quick note before we get into it. I know there were some quiet parts of yesterday's episode. I think it has to do with my microphone randomly cutting out, and I tried to kind of like diagnose the issue today, and it also happened today. I was recording the Ethub podcast with Eric, and it kept happening. It was super annoying. I had to end up recording off my laptop. But I think maybe I fixed it. I don't know. And unless I'm looking at the OBS uh, kind of recording software here and looking at my microphone, I'm not picking up me talking. I'm not going to tell if I cut out or not. So if I cut out again, apologies. I'm going to try again to fix it tomorrow if it hasn't been fixed by now. I, I, it just happens randomly. So it's really hard for me to test if it's been fixed or not. I think it had something to do with the power. Um, my microphone was plugged into a USB hub. It wasn't a powered USB hub. But that's how it wasn't like, you know, I guess like a week ago. So I don't know what happened since then. And Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with the details there. Just in case it happens again, you, you know why. It's just my microphone cutting out without me realizing, and then it comes back like a few seconds later. So yeah, apologies for that. But anyway, onto the news. So well, onto a tweet that I put out today first. So I put out this tweet where, today where I said, Bitcoin is talking about Ethereum's monetary policy again. The ETH BTC ratio must be going up. Now... <laughs> I put this out because, I don't know, for some reason, the Bitcoiners decided today was the day they would talk about Ethereum's mon monetary policy again. And of course, they don't have anything good to say about Ethereum's monetary policy. They always go on about how it can change. It's not credibly neutral. Uh, you know, it's like the fiat system, blah, blah, right? Well, we've all heard, all heard these talking points before. Now, I saw this and then I went and looked at the ETH BTC chart and it's been going up the last week, right? Um, it, it's kind of like bounced back very nicely from the lows and it seems to be on, a, on an uptrend. And I just kind of look at that. And I'm like, okay, well, every time that happens, the Bitcoin has come out of the woodwork and there's a lot of cope about it, right? They kind of like, it, it, there's a lot of kind of anger about it. There's a lot of people being like, how could this happen? You know, ETH, to them, to the Bitcoin maximalist, ETH is a quote unquote worthless shit coin, right? So how can this thing be outperforming Bitcoin? And it's ironic because there's so many things that outperform Bitcoin, but just for the sake of, of what I'm talking about here, we'll just stick with ETH. Um, and it was just funny how like I, I kind of saw that. Now, this was the topic of today's newsletter as well today. But my point of kind of kind of here is that there's a lot of tribes in crypto. I mean, we all know, right? There's a lot of tribes in, in you know, in and outside of crypto, but like specifically in crypto, because we're so close to it, we can see all the tribes forming. There's a Bitcoin tribe, there's an Ethereum tribe, there's a Solana tribe, there's an Avalanche tribe, there's a blah, 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 blah tribe, right? And there's so much kind of like hypocrisy between the tribes. It's hilarious, right? The amount of people who have um, kind of like shit all over Ethereum for months now about the high gas fees, for years now about the high gas fees, are the same people who preach, let's, you know, we're all in this together. Let's all kind of like work together. Let's not be maximalist, blah, blah, blah. And it's just kind of like, well, okay, if you actually believe that, then why are you always shitting all over Ethereum? There's there's ways to be construct constructive about Ethereum. You know, constructive criticism about the high gas fees would be, well, okay, the high gas fees on layer one are causing users to go elsewhere because the layer two ecosystem um, isn't, you know, where we want it to be yet. I mean, to me, it's pretty much where, you know, it's pretty much at a really good place right now. But just generally, that's like the con constructive feedback. The non-constructive feedback is ETH L1 or kind of Ethereum is so expensive to use. It's a shit chain. It's only for whales. I'm going to go use this. I don't care about decentralization. Who cares about that? Blah, blah, blah. Like that's just not constructive. That's basically just maximalism talking or tribalism talking. Tribalism and maximalism are pretty much the same thing, um, funny enough. But you know, this is play obviously played out for, you know, since the dawn of humanity, this tribalism. But I think in crypto, it's uh, it's very kind of like um, pronounced because of two factors. Anonymity, which, you know, anyone can spin up a Twitter account. You don't have to ha attach your real name or identity to it. And you can go and kind of like spread all the bullshit you want. And really, there's no kind of recourse to that, especially for anonymous. If your account gets banned, you start another one, do it all over again. Um, and second is the keyboard warrior phenomenon where people feel a lot more comfortable, you know, uh, uh, saying certain things via a keyboard than they would in real life. Like, for example, there's a lot of people who throw insults out like they're nothing online, but in real life, they'd be hard pressed to do that. It's a very, very different, um, and to the, to the same person, it's a very, very different dynamic. But um, those are two kind of things they confound on each other. And then you have all the stuff in crypto, the economic incentive, the religiousness, the just general maximalism, all that sort of stuff. And it all comes together. So I guess like my overall point is that you got to be really careful not to fall into these things. You know, some people may argue that I fall into it and that I'm like an ETH maxi and that I, I don't care about other chains because I never talk about them. But at the end of the day, like, 
I'm sorry I don't have the time to talk about other chains or to kind of like look into other chains. And frankly, most of them don't interest me. Like I've said it before and I'll say it again. Most of them take too many shortcuts for my liking. They're not doing what Ethereum is trying to do. I think Ethereum is cool and special. I try to keep up with the Ethereum ecosystem. It takes all my time already. So I'm not going to go and spend time in other ecosystems. Does that make me a maximalist? I don't think so. Does that make uh, make me a bit tribal? Yeah, sure. I'm tribal over, over Ethereum. I get really upset when people are spreading crap about Ethereum. Um, you know, even if there's an element of truth to it, it depends how it's being spread. Like, as I said, with the gas fees, there's a constructive way to give feedback and there's a non-constructive way. And obviously a lot of people take the non-constructive way if they're trying to pump something else. Like if you're trying to pump another chain up, then you're going to basically make Ethereum look really bad and put Ethereum in really bad light because it's better for the chain that you're trying to promote. So from that perspective, I mean, it makes sense, right? It's just all incentives at the end of the day, but it's also just really shitty to be around. Like you remember a few months ago, guys, like I put out that tweet where I said, I can't get involved in the Twitter fights anymore and the Twitter debates because it's just, I mean, it's too much. It takes a mental toll and it also is a kind of a waste of time. Like there's no nuanced debate that can be had on Twitter ever. Like, I mean, I remember Vitalik did an experiment where he basically... I think there was, a, oh, I think it was Udi and Vitalik did, did kind of like a back and forth and there was no replies uh, allowed. So no one could kind of like shit post a reply on it. They could quote tweet it and stuff like that, but it actually ended up being pretty constructive as a, as a debate. But the thing is it requires the two people debating maybe it's more than two people, to be constructive to begin with. You can't have a, a, a debate with someone who literally doesn't want to uh, kind of like m move their opinion or anything, is not open to, to changing their opinion on anything, and is not open to actually listening to the points that you're bringing up. And there's a lot of people out there like this, especially... You know, in the Bitcoin maximalist camp, they are very, very uh, religious about Bitcoin. Like, the, and and you know, even if you say anything kind of positive about another chain, it just it doesn't register with with them. Um, you know, it doesn't register at all, and they think that you're kind of like spinning bullshit. They think you're a scammer, all that, all, all that sort of stuff. And you know, a perfect example of this actually was recently where. Peter McCormack, who's very uh, obviously well known in the Bitcoin community, for years he's been trashing Ethereum, specifically around things like not being able to run a full node, uh, the fact that an Ethereum full node is not equivalent to a Bitcoin full node, you have to run an archive node, which is wrong. And he'd been saying this for many, many years, and all of us in the Ethereum community had been correcting him and constantly correcting him over this and constantly trying to educate him on this, and he didn't listen to it. He didn't care what we had to say. He never agreed with us. And then, I think a couple months ago, Kobe, Crypto Kobe, and you guys know who Kobe is he said the exact same thing to peter in a twitter thread that we had been saying for years and peter said oh okay well that makes sense so it's just it, it's really insane to me because the reason why peter listened to kobe and he didn't listen to the you know me and the other ethereans is because peter perceives me and the other ethereans as ethereum maxis he perceives us as bad actors as people who you know uh kind of like occasionally trash talk bitcoin so we're not worth listening to and anything we say is not the truth whereas kobe is positioned himself as more of a neutral party he doesn't really belong to any kind of like one crypto tribe um i you know it's kind of like funny how he's managed to actually do that it's pretty impressive but I think that's why he kind of listened to him because it's like a neutral third party. So if you're having a debate and it's just like two people, this is why you always need like a media mediator in a debate because it just makes it go it go a lot smoother. Um, but even then, like if the mediator is shit and just lets the debate kind of like uh, unravel and go go for itself, it can just be a really poor debate. And it's not limited to crypto. Again, it happens everywhere. I'm sure, you know, I, I watched a lot of the US presidential debates um, between Trump and Biden. I don't know why. I mean, I watched the highlights. I didn't watch the whole thing, but it was just like, it was, I mean, it was really bad. Like on on both sides, it was just horrible. Like they, they didn't want to listen to each other. The the kind of like mediator or the moderator, um, you know, I guess they did a decent job, but still like it, it felt like they were letting them it play out for ratings because those things get a lot of um, a lot of ratings. So there's a monetary incentive there. It just becomes disastrous. What the way I like to debate is if I know the person is open-minded and I know that they're kind of like uh, not going to just call me a maximalist, not just going to kind of like uh, uh, come at me aggressively, then I'm happy to debate. But there are certain people that I don't think is ever worth constructively debating or certain types of people. And there's plenty of them in crypto. So anyway, I'm going to leave it that at that for now. Just a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a kind of like rant there. But you obviously you guys see this play out as much as I do. And I think it's just always important to kind of like take a step back and kind of, I guess, take stock about it. Because the worst thing you can do is fall into this extreme tribalism, extreme maximalism, and, um, you know, not explore new ideas, not be open to new ideas and think that everything that uh, you already know is the way it should be. So, so yeah, anyway, moving on to the biggest news of the last 24 hours is that Mike 
MyCrypto is joining MetaMask. So in other words, MetaMask is acquiring the MyCrypto, uh, I guess, like application and team. Now, my crypto has a uh, has a pretty long history. I mean, they spun out of my Ether wallet a while ago, and you know, my Ether wallet was actually the first Ethereum wallet I used, I believe. Um, at least fir first on the kind of like the desktop. I, I think there was a random mobile wallet that I used in 2017 before I discovered that it was a custodial mobile wallet, and I was like, ah, no, I'm not going to use this. And then I kind of like changed, and I think my Ether wallet was what I kind of um. I kind of, uh, uh, as my first one there, and then my crypto spun out of it, uh, Taylor Monaghan leading uh, the, the team there, and I started using my crypto a lot. Uh, and you know, it, 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 it's always been reliable for me. I mean, I think everyone's either used my Ether wallet or my, my crypto at this point. Obviously everyone's used MetaMask, but this is kind of really cool that the fact that then they're, they're joining the MetaMask uh, team, MetaMask family here as a kind of like uh, aqua hire again. And you know, some people kind of like brought up some concerns about this saying, you know, there's less competition in the wallet space now. I don't think so. There are so many wallets, uh, uh, Web3 wallets, Ethereum wallets out there right now that I don't think it's actually... Um, a bad thing. I think what's happening here is that MetaMask and MyCrypto get to join forces and become much better uh, together than they were apart. Because there are problems, obviously, with with MetaMask. A lot of problems with MetaMask. And I think um, I'm, I'm not sure how much of that stems from the MetaMask team itself versus consensus as an organization, maybe holding them back for whatever reason. Uh, it could be either or because as you guys know, MetaMask is part of consensus. They're not their own company. Whereas MyCrypto was an independent organization, was not part of anything else. Now they've been acquired by MetaMask and the team is there. They may be able to to do some more stuff here. They may be able to, to, to do some better stuff to make MetaMask a much better wallet than what it is. Obviously, it's missing a lot of features, the MetaMask um, desktop uh, brow browser extension here. There are other wallets out there on other chains that are actually, uh, you know, yeah, other browser extension wallets that are really cool. Like um, the Solana's Phantom is actually pretty cool. Like I'll give them credit for that. It's a pretty cool wallet. Uh, and they said they were going to support Ethereum eventually, but I doubt that's coming for a while. I, I feel like um, it being the premier wallet on Solana, it's kind of like not in their best interest to support Ethereum um, anytime soon. Maybe they, I mean, maybe, maybe they'll prove me wrong, but yeah, I, I think um, we should just, work on vastly improving MetaMask, especially because MetaMask and the My Crypto, crypto team are Ethereum aligned, whereas I believe the Phantom team is more of a kind of like Solana ecosystem play and, and, and they're more aligned with Solana, which is totally fine. But I, I, I don't want to give up on what we already have. Like MetaMask is, is awesome for what it is. It can be a lot better. So I'm hoping that this acquisition makes MetaMask uh, a much better a much better wallet. I think it will. Um, I think the My Crypto app is still going to be around. I think there was a question asked. Uh, yeah, so there was a question asked from Lef Left Terrace here who said, "Will the local My Crypto wallet continue to be developed?" Uh, and then Taylor answered, "Yes, it's all, it's also being re reworked." Uh, so double yes. And then the second question actually was pretty interesting. My Crypto uses an open source license, but MetaMask is a proprietary one. Will your license change? And as you guys will be aware, MetaMask uh, is behind a proprietary license where um, if you have more than ten thousand people using it, I believe this is the license license terms, you have to pay MetaMask uh, to, to use it. Um, and then Taylor's response to this question was, there will be a fight to the death, so I'll keep you uh, I'll keep you posted. Then Finlay, who uh, is kind of like one of the founders of MetaMask, or uh, said, we've got some plans to move the MetaMask license uh, uh, more open again as well, likely BSL, which is a business license or something, while we explore other options. Uh, and then Lefteris says, BSL obviously is not um, is not open source. We, I mean, Nicholas says here, yeah, it kind of like is open source, but I mean, there's a bit of back and forth. I'm not going to go through all that, but it's it's not like the traditional kind of like super open source license that we all kind of uh, uh, know and love from from crypto generally. But yeah, I mean, it seems like there's going to be some changes around with, with MetaMask. And I think that's kind of like welcome, welcome changes there. I, ho I really hope to see the um, the wallet get better. I mean, I still use it. I mean, you can see it in my browser here. I still use it all the time uh, for a pass through for my kind of like hardware wallets, for connecting mobile wallets and stuff like that. Um, I love using it. It's, it's reliable. Like, uh, you know, once they fix the hardware wallet integration, um, it hasn't kind of like stuffed up for me since then uh, with the Ledger. Um, I, I, you know, the funny thing is I used my Lattice as well, but I have like both. I use Ledger and Lattice. Um, but uh, since they kind of like fixed the integration with Ledger there, uh, it's just been a smooth experience. So hoping to see uh, some kind of like positive benefits come out of this Aqua Hire here. 
So another Ethereum cat herders update for January 2022 is out. Now, you guys have, will probably be familiar with this. I've, I brought them up pretty much every month that they do these updates, but the Ethereum cat herders is, an, is a, a kind of like organization that does updates on core Ethereum uh, protocol development and research. It covers basically everything. If you want to know anything about Ethereum core development, you need to check out their, their, their kind of like updates here. So... This update is uh, covers January. It covers things like the Kill and Testnet, uh, the Girly Shadow Fork, the Kintsugi Testnet, of course, um, Shanghai AIPs, uh, insights into different AIPs, and a bunch more. Uh, you can go give this a, a read. It'll be in the blog post. Obviously, it's a long. Sorry, it'll be in the YouTube description. Obviously, it's a long blog post here, so I'm not going to go through everything, but it has links to so much. You could spend a good week kind of just like going through all this stuff, like going into the links, going to the links that are the, that are from there, and it, it can be really fun as well. So, I mean, I only recommend this to people who are interested in core development, the technical stuff. Uh, some of it may be boring to you if you're not interested in that sort of stuff, but there's so much going on in Ethereum core protocol land, uh, and this is core protocol. This isn't um, so much layer two stuff. This is like layer one core protocol work across both ETH1 and ETH2, or as they're known as execution layer and consensus layer stuff here. So definitely go check this out. It'll be linked in the blog post uh, in the YouTube description below. So an update out of the EF ecosystem support program. So this is the update of their latest grantee roundup from December, 2021, featuring a L2 beat and the gas OL gas optimization toolkit from the Costa group. So this is just kind of like two projects and update here on what they've been doing. Uh, obviously you guys know L2 beat and uh, all the, all the good stuff that they're doing, all the good work that they're doing. I've been talking about them a lot for a few months now. Um, so yeah, this is just an update from the EF here. So I just wanted to highlight this. It's a small update. It will obviously be linked in the YouTube description, but you should definitely go check it out. So some ENS stats from January of this year that Brantley put out. So 67,000 new .eth registrations on ETH L1. L2 is coming soon. Oh, L2 coming soon for ENS, guys. $4 million in protocol revenue which all goes to the DAO, 40,000 new ETH accounts with at least one ANS name, total is now 291,000, 56 new integrations, total of 479, uh, 66, uh, sorry, 99% of OpenSea volume for domains. So obviously ENS continues its monumental lead in the domain space. There's a lot of people still registering their .eth names. I see a bunch of kind of like celebrities from um, every now and again, registering their .eth names and kind of repping them on Twitter, which is really, really awesome. But uh, but yeah, it's just cool to see that the growth is still there. Um, and I'm curious to see what their L2 integration looks like as well. Like I would really love to be able to kind of like do ENS stuff on L2 because the costs are going to uh, going to be kind of like uh, uh, be lower than on L1, obviously. And registering an ENS name, depending on what the gas price is, can actually be quite expensive. So it makes sense for them to obviously do an L L2 integration here. So very uh, nice to see this growth from ENS. Uh, definitely give Brantley a follow, by the way. He tweets a lot about ENS. If you're interested in ENS, Brantley's probably the top follow here, uh, of, you know, besides the official ENS uh, domains Twitter account as, as well. So another bridge has been introduced uh, the last 24 hours uh, called Scalic, which is a cross-chain bridge that's cheaper by using snarks and more transparent about security, security using optimistic relaying and fraud proof. So you can test it out right now by sending an NFT from Polygon mainnet to this address here. You can use OpenSea's UI to do it. Now, obviously this is highly experimental and not anything that you should be uh, doing with uh, kind of like any real sorts of value here. Uh, but this is really cool. This is, I think this is an independent developer. I don't know how to say their name. Is it w w Wei J or something like that? I don't know how exactly how to sound, how to say it, but it's not a team or anything. It's an independent developer kind of building this. Um, but uh, this is this is awesome. So once uh, he explains how it works here, or he or she, once the bridge receives 16 NFTs or after two days have elapsed, it'll move them to Arbitrum 1 you, where you'll receive the wrapped NFT. The steps needed to relay them back to Polygon will come in a separate post. Uh, there's a bunch of more details here, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is just really cool. It's another kind of like a bridge here, specifically focused on NFT stuff as well, which I haven't really seen much of. NFTs are actually much harder to bridge, and you know, I actually saw a question recently about why NFTs are still on Ethereum and why other NFT ecosystems haven't really taken off. I think because it's so hard to move the NFT ecosystem from one chain to another because of the fact that they're non-fungible. Fungible tokens are really easy to move cross-chain because they're just all the same thing, right? Like I've talked about how the bridges give you IOUs and all that sort of stuff, but it's much easier to move that kind of like liquidity across 
because of it being fungible. Whereas with its non-fungible, moving a profile picture collection across to another chain, like the whole collection across, uh, would not work, right? Moving the NFT, uh, one NFT or two NFTs from that collection to another chain, I mean, you could wrap it or something like that, but like it kind of does, it kind of, it makes it just literally difficult for apps to integrate with it, to track it, for like OpenSea to integrate with it, stuff like that. And then, um, you know, you might be buying the wrapped version of it instead of the real version of it, and then you take on bridge risk and all these sorts of stuff. So, from there, I think it's the, the fungibility or the non-fungibility aspect here that makes the NFT ecosystem on Ethereum so sticky. But also, I mean, Ethereum is like the culture hub, really. I mean, even if it's on L1, it's still the culture hub. And NFTs are obviously very popular on Ethereum L1. Uh, and, you know, there's projects on L2 spinning up as well. So I thought that was just something really interesting that I've, uh, that I've noticed recently as well. So Starkware put out some stats recently of their Starknet Alpha. So there's 10,000 smart contracts with 60,000 account contracts and 70,000 contracts deployed on Starknet Alpha on the Girly testnet over the past 10 weeks here. So just two and a half months. That's really cool. I mean, that's a lot, right? 70,000 contracts. I'd be curious to see what contracts they are. Obviously, they're not all going to be contracts that are part of like full-blown applications. They could be certain contracts for, for different things. I mean, tokens are contracts as well. So it could just be random tokens, people kind of like testing things out, seeing what's going on there. But I, uh, yeah, I thought this was really cool to see the traction that they're having here. Because as you guys know, Starknet is not an EVM compatible or EVM equivalent network. Starknet is, has the, they have the transpiler, the, um, the warp transpiler from the Nethermind team that I've spoken about before. But if you want to develop natively on Starknet, you need to use their own language or Starkware's own language, Cairo, with along with StarkX. It's, you don't use Solidity and the EVM. So I like seeing traction in ecosystems that are non-EVM to see just like how much demand there is for that. The only other big non-EVM ecosystem I can think of is is Solana, um, which uses kind of like Rust and the own kind of like Solana um, mach uh, virtual machine there. And then there's also, uh, I think Terra as well, but Terra is, is, is Terra is a bit different. They're trying to do like a stable coin ecosystem thing, not just like a generalized platform. Um, at least from that's what, from what I've seen, I'm probably going to have some Terra people yell at me for saying that. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm behind there, but um, in terms of kind of like layer twos, it really is just like Starkware right now. Plus, I think the Polygon teams and ZK Sync has uh, has some stuff that they're doing right now uh, as well. Like that's not EVM, but I don't think much of that is out just yet in the same way Starknet is. So yeah, cool to see this traction on Starknet here. So Ed Felton from Offchain Labs, the team behind uh, Arbitrum, put out a, a, a great thread today about all the innovations that Arbitrum has kind of come up with over the years. Now, for those of you who don't know, Arbitrum's actually been working, or Offchain Labs has been working on uh, layer two interactive fraud proof systems, optimistic roll-up systems, before they were called optimistic roll-ups, since 2014. So this predates Ethereum mainnet, because Ethereum mainnet went live uh, mid-2015. So they've been working on this for a while, and there's a lot of innovations that have come out of it. So you, in this thread, Ed goes through all the innovations, well, not all of them, but a lot of them, especially around fraud proofs. Uh, you should give this thread a read, by the way. It's actually really good. It's, it's not a long thread, but it's actually really good to see like just how much innovation have, has come out of the Off-Chain Labs team over the years and how long they've been at it for. I mean, 2014 is a long time ago now, guys. That's like seven years ago or even more than that, depending... Uh, what, of what part of 2014, but let's say it's about seven years now. As I, and as I said, it predates Ethereum, so it's basically all of Ethereum's life and then some. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think this video here that he's linking to is. Um I can't remember what date or month that was kind of like in in 2014, but it might even predate kind of like uh, Ethereum's ICO, which which happened in mid 2014, I believe. So so yeah, just a cool little thread here that I highly recommend you guys uh, go and give a read. So a new project announced itself today called, man, I don't even know how to pronounce this, Koipa, Koopa. Um, I don't know, maybe they've got how to pronounce it in the in the blog post here. I don't actually think so. I, I'm just going to say Koopa for now. So Koopa Finance describes itself as a new public protocol for indices and baskets aiming to make the benefits of, of portfolio diversification available to all. So the protocol is, is a set of rules governing how four key participants interact, the index publishers, the asset issuers, the basket rebalancers, and the holders. Um, and then they go on to kind of like describe what makes Cooper unique here. So just a quick kind of like mental model for you guys. This is pretty similar to set protocol. Uh, if you know, if you're familiar with set protocol, as you guys know, 
I'm involved with set protocol in terms of like just creating like infrastructure to build these, I guess, asset management products on top of and sort of things like that. So that's a kind of mental model to have there. But the way Cupid is doing it, they're kind of like going for governance minimization. So you can see here the protocol is permissionless. I mean, sets permissionless as well. But they, but after it's been deployed, there is no upgradable contracts. Um, there is minimum viable governance. So governance can only tune three auction parameters and can raise its split of streaming fees up to a maximum of 20%. Uh, and uses Ethereum mainnet as a settlement layer here. So that is, I guess, like a key difference there where it's very, very governance minimized and they're going to be launching this as part of a, 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 a soft launch. So the contracts have not been obviously tested yet or anything like that. Um, and, you know, please evaluate the risks of being a participant before participating. Uh, the contracts, uh, I think, uh, were audited from, with code for arena and a private review of a final mitigations blah, blah blah so there's about much more info in here and if you want to join the team as well you can apply to, to get involved there but i think this is cool i mean like as much i mean it's kind of like i mean obviously i'm still advise i'm still an advisor to set protocol here and i think they're doing a lot of amazing work but competition is always good competition breeds innovation it is not something that uh i i think i i, I would be kind of like disappointed if there was like set protocol was the only asset management protocol on, on Ethereum and they kind of like had a monopoly on it. I like seeing competition because it pushes every team to be better and it pushes every team not to stagnate because if you have like a monopoly, you tend to stagnate. We see this all the time in various industries that have uh, monopolies. They stagnate and they stagnate really, really bad. So from that perspective, you definitely want uh, want competition here. But yeah, I thought this was well, this was interesting. You can go check out more information at the site as well at quipa.finance. Um, the app's already uh, kind of live here, I think, if I wanted to connect my wallet to it. Um, MetaMask has just popped up then. Uh, you, know, you know, you can propose a new index and things like that. You can kind of like manage a basket into contract address. It's still early, right? This is not something that's, uh, that's for the faint of heart. It's obviously something that, um, yeah, uh, that you kind of like need to know uh, your way around. And there's docs as well, if you want to read these as well. So there's an FAQ, there's governance docs. I mean, there's kind of light right now, but as I said, this was just announced. It is, is very new. So definitely go uh, check this out if you're interested in, in this. It will be linked in the YouTube description. All right, finally, we have another announcement out of DevConnect. So DevConnect is scheduled to take place in Amsterdam between the 18th and 25th of April, 2022. So in this post, they've detailed all the events that are happening so far. There is so much going on, guys. Like, holy crap, I'm getting so excited. Like I looked, Layer 2 Amsterdam, ETH Economics, DeFi Day, uh, staking gathering uh, with ETH. I mean, and it's all being hosted by different groups as well. Like ETH Staker is hosting Staking Day. L2 Beat is hosting the Layer 2 stuff. ETH uh, Economics is being hosted by the Robust Incentives Group who work at the Ethereum Foundation and have done a lot of great work around EIP 1559 and other Ethereum economic related things. And I mean, there's so many more events here. So definitely recommend giving this a read. I am so pumped for this. I've started looking into like what the, I guess, go is for getting to Amsterdam from Australia. <laughs> and I saw on the on the list on the Netherlands website that Australia is still considered a high risk uh, travel zone, and so is like the United States and Canada and in you know a lot of the other popular places in the world. I'm hoping that changes by the time April rolls around, because if it doesn't, really the only people who will be able to go to this conference will be people that are based in Europe. <laughs> so I'm hoping it changes. I think it will. I mean, April's still you know a couple of months away. I guess more than a couple months away now until uh, April 18th, but uh, this would be the only that would be the only thing that barred me from going to this conference the the COVID restrictions. If the if the co if there aren't those restrictions, I'm definitely going to be there. I I've never been to Amsterdam. I've heard only good things about it. Um, I heard that it's actually similar to Melbourne and its multiculturalism. And obviously, I love Melbourne. It's, you know, I've lived here my whole life. But uh, very very excited for the events in general too. I'm planning to go to so many of these, uh, you know, as many of these as I can, and I hope to meet a lot of you there as well. Like I've saw. A few of you have already said that you're going to be going as well. It's shaping up to be an absolutely amazing conference. So on that note, I'm going to end it there. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.